Today we discuss how would a hypothetical nuclear war between France and UK go. Both countries are usually cited as the third and fourth biggest holders of nuclear weapons. While China may have overtaken them recently, both still possess sizable nuclear programs. Nuclear-fueled submarines are the mainstay of both countries' deterrence arsenals, as they carry the intercontinental ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads. Both France and UK feature four such submarines each. But would that mean both sides are equally powerful? Let's find out. Did you know that the UK has seven active nuclear power plants while France has 19? And as Fukushima accident showed, each of those locations, if destroyed, can spew out radioactive fallout for years, longer than a nuclear bomb explosion, in fact. Magellan TV, which is sponsoring this video, has a cool documentary covering the Fukushima accident. I liked Fukushima Robots in Hell not only because it went through the accident itself, but because it also covered the issue of protecting electronics against radiation, which would be quite important in a nuclear war. Magellan TV is a new streaming service founded by filmmakers, which offers documentaries on all sorts of topics, including history, science, space or nature. New programs are added weekly and you can stream the content anywhere on your TV, laptop or phone. Pinkov invites you to try out Magellan TV. Our viewers will get an exclusive one-month free membership trial by clicking the link in the video description below or by going to MagellanTV.com slash Battlegrounds. By checking out Magellan TV, you're also supporting our channel. Let us go back to our nuclear war. As said, both sides feature four nuclear subs. The UK has the Vanguard class, while France uses the Tronfond class. The French subs are a tad smaller, as they carry somewhat smaller missiles. But that matters not in this scenario, as France and UK are right next to each other. Even the farthest away points of their mainlands are still fairly close. The shorter range of French missiles is still very much sufficient for this war of neighbors. The UK uses US Trident II missiles. They are leased from the US and maintained there and are a cheaper option, really, than developing and maintaining own missile designs like France does. France has recently finished switching to new M51 ballistic missiles. As one can notice, the Trident missile is in theory also superior when it comes to warhead count. But in the post-Cold War real world, no country, not even the US, loads their missiles to the max with warheads. In fact, the UK stockpile of warheads is smaller than the missile capacity. British defense documents cite rather small warhead counts. As of today, UK has in its arsenal a total of 200 warheads. Part of those are undergoing maintenance and part is simply stored. Deployed warheads number some 120. How does France compare? Its submarine-launched missile stockpile numbers some 240 warheads. However, actual deployed warhead count is smaller, though not publicized. What was officially stated by France is that it keeps 48 of its sub-launched ballistic missiles deployed. Binkov will use an estimate from the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, leading to a deployed warhead count of up to 80 warheads per submarine, meaning 5 warheads per missile, possibly less on some missiles for mission flexibility reasons. UK keeps fewer missiles deployed, out of its entire stock only 24 or 8 missiles per each of the three of the deployable submarines. Furthermore, UK stated 40 warheads are carried on a submarine, meaning 5 warheads per missile. Neither side has a theoretical stockpile of warheads big enough to use the entire missile capacity even if the war came slowly, so they have months or even a year to prepare. Since allowing for preparation always adds way too many variables, this scenario will assume virtually no preparation time war breaking out at once, with both sides scrambling to deliver orders to their submarines and launching those missiles to their new coordinates. Such prep time limit also means that actual missiles to be fired are not going to be numerous. Out of four subs that each side has, one sub is on permanent patrol, probably somewhere in the Atlantic. It could launch its missiles right after it receives the order. I think that order might not be instantaneous. US subs used to receive only very short messages when going deep, via ELF transmitters. But those have such stringent requirements, like huge areas and specific soil type, that neither UK nor France have them. So communication would be via VLF. 
While those frequencies still penetrate underwater, the receiving antenna needs to be fairly close to the surface. Since nuke subs may not always have their communication buoy extended behind them, they may not get the message right away. Both France and UK use only land-based VLF transmitters. Which means it's possible, though unlikely, the transmitters themselves would be damaged before a submarine receives a message. In the unlikely event that all VLF transmitters are damaged in the opening hours, the submarine may have to actually go to periscope depth and communicate via more regular frequencies, exposing itself more to the enemy. But realistically, neither UK nor France have nearly enough platforms to patrol the Atlantic and to put the other side in danger, even if the nuke sub does have to get close to the surface. Anyway, another of the four mentioned subs is usually in high readiness. One crew is always around the submarine and the sub could potentially sail out on an emergency in a very short period of time. Sub could in theory fire the missiles from the port, but there are some issues with that. The Trident system wasn't planned with such launches in mind. Buoyancy of the vessel would be severely impacted. Also, the distance between UK and France is so small that it would be hard for the missile to disperse their multiple warheads. While a ballistic missile can, in theory, have no minimal range, release of multiple warheads must occur over some area, meaning there is a practical minimum range to the missiles. Ultimately, it's likely submarines would indeed sail out from the port at least a little before firing. The third sub is usually undergoing some pierside maintenance. The nuclear missiles themselves are usually always on board the subs. Certain parts are still detached from the missiles for safety reasons, so the crew may or may not make the sub and the missiles launch ready, depending on the time remaining. The fourth sub is always under some heavy maintenance, usually in a dry dock, and thus has no weapons deployed. But within several hours of war, both sides could fire missiles from at least two of their subs, with one of those subs firing just after leaving the port. The third sub may be able to launch its missiles from port if needed sometime later, when everything is prepped for the launch. The process of transmitting and receiving orders, as well as flight time of missiles, is fairly short, but it may still allow for enough time that some aircraft get in the air and try to reach the other side's strategic assets before a launch from the port happens. French nuclear subbase is positioned in a much worse location than the UK one. France has its nuke subs in Brest. The British keep their subs in Scotland, near Glasgow. The French would have a much harder time reaching the British sub-base with cruise missiles and planes in a matter of mere hours than the British would have reaching the French base. The French have almost no territory depth and would get very little warning time to organize a defense, unlike the British. It is thus conceivable that at least some of the last-ditch desperate attempt of an preemptive strike reaches the French third submarine before it can fire its missiles from the port. French planes have greater chances of being intercepted if they try to do the same reaching the British base in Scotland, since they have to cross a longer route to get in launch range of their cruise missiles. The French would need to fly some extra 600 to 1000 kilometers, depending on the route, to go around the UK into a favorable launch position, while the British could launch their cruise missiles from the safety of their own territory. Of course, with mere hours of preparation, it's highly unlikely many planes would be available and many cruise missiles could be launched in time. But cruise missiles are slow, so two to three hours or more may elapse until they reach the target. It is still possible the British would launch missiles from their third submarine in time. The British planes and missiles would also have to deal with stronger ground-based air defenses. The UK doesn't have any medium or long-range ground-to-air missile systems it's likely at least some of the French systems would aid in defense of the base near Brest. Even so, the fact the French base is so close compels Binkov to give at least some edge to the British. They would probably lose most of their strike group planes in the attack on Brest, but chances for getting the sub that's undergoing regular maintenance before launching its missiles are somewhat higher than for the French. Thus France will be modeled in this scenario as being prevented from launching half a missile load from one of their subs in the Brest base. So the grand total of missiles in the air is now 24 missiles from the British and 40 missiles for the French. It is also quite possible that the warheads from the initial launch from the Atlantic might reach each side's submarine base before that third sub manages to launch. 
Due to that uncertainty, Binkov will subtract another half a load from one submarine in each base. That assumes the remaining half is caught up in a nuclear blast. Thus the updated missile and warhead counts will be as shown. Neither side has any anti-ballistic missile defenses that could deal with such class of missiles. Aster surface-to-air missiles, while having some ABM capability, are meant to be used against smaller and slower missiles. But all of the count so far has not included something else. Air-launched nuclear weapons. While neither side uses ground-launched missiles, the British have retired their air-launched weapons. The French, however, still maintain an arsenal of air-launched missiles with nuclear warheads. France has previously stated it has 54 of such missiles deployed. Both the French Air Force and Navy operate the said missile, with Rafale aircraft launching them. It is not plausible that all of them could be launched before all hell breaks loose, and certainly most of the initially known airbases would be demolished by nuclear weapons. But it's likely at least part of the French air fleet would be dispersed to areas unlikely to be hit and used as staging grounds for secondary strikes against the UK. In theory, a very small number of Rafales may be ready on station to strike against the UK, each carrying one missile, even at around the same time the submarine-launched missiles start flying. ASMP missiles have enough range to reach a good deal of southern England, and they are fast enough that UK ground-based air defenses would mostly be helpless. Thus the total number of warheads launched changes once more, assuming two dozen Rafale planes with ASMPs disperse in time and launch before being destroyed. France does have some visible advantage here. Not only would it launch approximately 50% more warheads, but since its missiles carry less warheads on average, various malfunctions would lead to fewer warheads lost en route. For simplicity's sake though, Binkov will assume no malfunctions would happen. So what damage would a warhead do? Depends where it hits. All those missiles are fairly accurate, so even if their warheads detonate 100 yards away from the intended spot, everything in a large radius from the target will still get demolished. Cities would be targeted, for sure, but other target types would be numerous. Like strategic sites, such as the mentioned nuke sub-harbors, submarine communication sites, air force bases, various strategic military sites, industrial centers, power plants, as well as large commercial ports. Those sites may not feature as many dead as when a warhead detonates over a city. It is likely that between a third and a half of the warheads would land solely on population centers. Population that is alive but is deprived of modern infrastructure, healthcare and easy access to food and water can be more of a problem for a nation than having a small portion of the population dead, but otherwise having little damage to the rest of the country's infrastructure. Plus, leaving the other side's military sites untouched is not wise, if your own country is left in complete shambles. For more details on actual effects of a nuclear blast, damage models and casualty models, please refer to our Global Nuclear Showdown video. The link is available below in the video description. To cite just one of the studies mentioned there, 10 Trident warheads would be needed to wipe out central Moscow, and in the process kill 4.5 million people. Another 10 warheads used in the suburbs of Moscow, which are, as all suburbs, much less densely populated, would kill less people, some 900,000. Population density of Moscow and London is roughly similar, with Paris having a more densely populated downtown. But the number of dead would still be quite high and comparable for all capitals. Instead of using even more warheads on the capitals over the suburbs, it's likely other population centers would get hit. France does have another advantage. It's a larger country. Its population is more dispersed, in a larger number of medium-sized and smaller cities, while the UK has more of the high-population urban sprawls. Most of Scotland is, for example, visibly empty, further distorting the shown figures in France's favor. When one looks at the other big cities, the sad trend is visible, and France does have almost double the population in small settlements and rural areas so France would be firing more warheads, with some of the warheads being more powerful, at targets with larger population density. The larger French warheads would obviously do greater damage, and when detonated over London, would result in up to double the fatalities, compared to 100 kiloton warheads. As said, most of the warheads would not go solely after population centers. 
yet a significant number would still target cities. With Paris and London receiving a dozen warheads each and several of the million plus cities getting two warheads, we might be looking at some two dozen more French cities of under a million citizens nuked and perhaps five dozen or so similar British cities nuked. Using similar modeling to the Moscow attack casualties model, as well as the models by NukeMap software, while including various settlements around strategic and industrial targets, each housing a hundred thousand dead, final tally may reach catastrophic figures. Keep in mind, these are just the dead. Moscow attack model says injured people will number little over twice those figures, at least in densely populated areas. Those casualties would not be final, of course. Some of the injured may die without proper medical care, and the hospital system on both sides would be in ruins. There would also be some 20% of additional deaths due to radiation sickness within a month, as modeled per Hiroshima bombing. There would also be shortages of food and drinking water. There would be looting and fights breaking out. Diseases too, eventually. It's not unlikely we'd be looking at much higher number of dead within a year or two, if other countries in the world don't try to help with humanitarian aid. Both countries would not really exist as functioning countries. Infrastructure gone, industry gone, most of the population incapacitated or dead. So there would be no real winner. It's evident France would lose a bit less, but it would still be less than even a Pyrrhic victory. Oh, and before you go, think about subscribing if you like my content. If you want to be notified of my upcoming videos, subscribing is not enough. You also have to click that bell-shaped notification icon. And if you're viewing Binkov on a phone, notifications from YouTube also need to be turned on. Well, that's it for now. Salutations! And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together. <laughs>